Hey guys, welcome to your video lecture for your next unit, classification. This is a really short and sweet unit, okay? So make sure you pay attention during the video lecture and take really good notes. The topic is the classification of living things, and we're going to focus on two aspects of classification. The why, why do we classify things, and the how, how do we classify things. So let's start by talking about the why. So first of all, the science that we're dealing with when we're talking about classification of living things is called taxonomy. So this is the branch of biology that names and organizes organisms according to their characteristics. So we're starting off with the why. Why do we classify? Well, we classify for a lot of reasons, but three of the big, qu big, big questions that we're trying to answer when we classify are how many known species are there, what are the defining characteristics of each species, and what are the relationships between these species? So this is the why. Why do we classify? So the first person who really attempted to do this was a Greek philosopher named Aristotle, and he classified organisms into two groups, plants and animals. And, you know, it started off okay, but then as um, you know, people became more educated, they started to realize that not everything fit into those two categories, and so we needed something a little more complex. Okay, so some of our limitations of early classification was that it was impossible to cl classify or all organisms into our two categories, plants and animals, like what about our little mushrooms here? They don't really fit there. Um, when we started learning about unicellular organisms, like an amoeba, that doesn't really fit into plants and animals. And then we now know that by classifying that way um, doesn't take into ac account evolutionary relationships, which is super important in biology. So this guy comes along, Carolus Linnaeus, and he devised a new classification system that was based on morphology. Morphology is an organism's form and structure, so it's anatomy, okay, morphology. Classification based on morphology. So uh, kind of a step up from what Aristotle was doing. Uh, that's why we call him the father of taxonomy. This guy was a really important person in classification. And he did two big things. He grouped organisms into a hierarchy of seven, seven different levels, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And he created a scientific naming system called binomial nomenclature that we still use today. So Carolus Linnaeus, father of taxonomy, really important guy. Let's start by talking about what this naming system is that he created. So it's called binomial nomenclature. Why do we need it? Why do we need a naming system that's universal for the naming of any organism? Well, first of all, because common names can be really misleading. For example, a jellyfish is not a fish, but a seahorse is a fish. Okay, common names vary by location. This guy right here, this big cat, some people might call him a puma, some people might call him a mountain lion, some people might say cougar, but they're all meaning the same animal. Common names vary by language. Okay, I'm going to butcher this, and I'm really sorry, but this little guy, I might call a chipmunk, but someone across the world might call it a strifenhornken, sorry, or a tamia or an ardea. Okay, but they're all talking about the same animal. So we need a way to have a system where when I say this name, no matter where I am in the world, everyone knows what I'm talking about. That was Carolus Linnaeus's goal with binomial nomenclature. So his first solution was to give a description of the organism using Latin, which is the language of science, Latin. So for example, he called a red oak this right here, which in Latin meant oak with leaves with deep blood lobes bearing hair-like bristles. Okay, and that's a very good description of a red oak. So what's the problem? Well, that's way too long, and it doesn't show evolutionary relationships. So then... Carolus Linnaeus developed this, which is our modern form of binomial nomenclature, a two-name scientific naming system. Bi meaning two, nomial meaning name, nomenclature meaning naming. So it's a two-name naming system. The first name in this two-name name is the genus of the organism, and the second name is the species identifier. There's a very specific way on how to write a scientific name. You either write it in italics, or you underline it, you always capitalize the first name, which is the genus, but the rest of the name should be lowercase. So this is what this looks like. So no matter where you are in the world, the scientific name of a vampire bat is Desmodus rotundus. So notice we're following our rules here. We've capitalized the genus name, so it belongs to the genus Desmodus, and we've kept everything else lowercase. Here's our species identifier, so it belongs to the species rotundus. No matter where you are in the world, that's the vampire bat scientific name. The little eastern chipmunk, remember this was the guy that was like the strife and horkin or whatever you call it. 
Uh, here's how we write his scientific name, no matter where you are in the world. So this one's in italics, this one's in underlined. Either way, totally acceptable to write a scientific name. Here's the scientific name of humans, which I'm sure you've heard before, Homo sapiens. And then here's a little extra credit for you. So Carolus Linnaeus wasn't born Carolus Linnaeus. He was actually born Carl Linné. I want you to look up why he changed his name, and it has to do with classification. So an extra credit point if you can come up with the answer there. So remember, I told you Carolus Linnaeus did two things. He came up with binomial nomenclature, this two-name naming system, but he also came up with a seven-level taxonomic hierarchy. So this classification level system. So today, the levels that we use are domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. With um, domain being the largest and species being the smallest, or domain being the most inclusive, and species being the most specific, okay, species specific. So you've got to come up with some way to remember this. Do kids prefer cheese over fried green spinach? Did King Philip come over for great spaghetti? I really encourage you to come up with your own acronym, something silly that will help you remember domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, with domain being the largest, most inclusive level, and species being the smallest, most specific. So this is sort of what this looks like, okay? Um, Kingdom, Animalia, includes all of these things right here. But if we go down our levels, Phylum Chordata, you can see we've gotten rid of the sea star because Chordata organisms have backbones. Now we've gotten rid of our snake because Class Mammalia contains all of our mammals. Now we've gotten rid of our little squirrel, right, because now we're in the carnivores. Uh, and then we get into our bears and then our two Ursus bears and then eventually our Ursus arctos, which is our polar bear. Okay, again, you can see how kingdom animalia is very inclusive. Here are some different phyla, class, orders, family, genus, species. Okay, so our scientific name of a lion is Panthera leo. He belongs to the genus Panthera, and, this, and his species identifier is leo. All right, now let's talk about domains. So we have three domains. Domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. And then within those three domains, we have six kingdoms. So remember, domain is the largest, most inclusive level. So modern taxonomy involves the use of Linnaeus's naming and classification system, but we've added on additional kingdoms. So Linnaeus, you know, he, he didn't have the knowledge that we have today, especially about like unicellular microscopic organisms. So this is what we, we accept today, even though it is slightly different than what Linnaeus came up with. He still developed a great system, you know, the different hierarchical, hierarchical levels and the binomial nomenclature naming system. So here are six kingdoms that we have, Archaebacteria, Eubacteria, Protista, Fungi, Plant, and Animal. And we're going to spend a lot of time on these individual kingdoms, so for today I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of each kingdom. So starting with Archaebacteria, Archaic means ancient. These are our super ancient bacteria, so we're talking about unicellular organisms that are prokaryotic. Remember, our only prokaryotes are bacteria. Everything else is eukaryotic. Prokaryotic means they don't have a nucleus or other membrane-bound organelles. So these are some of Earth's oldest life forms. Some of them are autotrophic, some of them are heterotrophic. But the key characteristic of RK bacteria are that they live in these really extreme environments. So thermophiles live in really hot environments. Acidophiles live in really um, acidic environments, which you could probably guess. And then halophiles actually live in really salty environments, so RK bacteria. Kingdom eubacteria is what you think of when you think of bacteria. So like the bacteria, um, the common bacteria that makes us sick, those all belong to eubacteria. So again, unicellular prokaryotic organisms, only bacteria are prokaryotic. Everything else is eukaryotic. Some are autotrophic, some are heterotrophic. They're found in the soil, in the water, in the human body. But unlike archaebacteria, um, a key difference is that eubacteria require oxygen. So in those extreme environments, sometimes oxygen is not available. Archaebacteria can still live there. Eubacteria cannot. It's because their cell walls are made of a substance called peptidoglycan, which we will talk about later. Kingdom Protista. The protist kingdom is also known as the junk drawer kingdom. 
Everyone has a junk drawer, right? It's where you throw everything that doesn't really fit anywhere else in your house. So kingdom protista is sort of where we throw the organisms that don't really fit into the other kingdoms. This kingdom will probably change by the time one of you guys is teaching biology. Uh, but for right now, this is what we sort of put everything that doesn't fit anywhere else. So these are our first eukaryotic organisms. Remember, only bacteria is prokaryotic. I know it's confusing because they start with protista. But these guys are eukaryotic. Um, some are multicellular, some are unicellular, some are autotrophic, some are heterotrophic. You find a little bit of everything, but the key is that they are eukaryotic organisms and they don't really fit into the kingdoms, into the other kingdoms. So we sort of shove them all together here. Then moving on to kingdom fungi. Again, eukaryotic. Most are multicellular, but we do have yeasts, which are unicellular. Fungi are heterotrophic. They are not autotrophs. They do not make their own food through photosynthesis. Okay, they are decomposers, we know that. They reproduce by spores and they have cell walls made of chitin. Plants, they are eukaryotic, they are multicellular, they are autotrophic, which means they make their food through photosynthesis. And their cell walls are made of a substance called cellulose. Then we have our animals, which are also eukaryotic, also multicellular, heterotrophic. Um, all animals are able to move at some point during their life cycle. Even sponges can move during their life cycle. They do not have cell walls. They only have cell membranes. So here's the sort of little chart if you want to use that to help you answer number seven. So moving on to modern taxonomy. So we've added a new component into how we classify things, and that is with the context of evolution, a really important uh, aspect of classification. Scientists use a variety of information in order to classify organisms. They use morphology, in other words, their anatomy, which we've already talked about, the biological macromolecules, so we're going to bring in some stuff we did last semester, and the fossil record. So by morphology, by classifying by morphology, they're basing their classification on inherited features that differ between species. In other words, they're looking at the anatomy and, and using that to say, okay, these organisms have similar anatomy, which must mean that they are more closely related. Then we have macromolecules. So by looking at the differences and the similarities between macromolecules, scientists draw conclusions. So for example, if we were to look at the amino acid differences between the hemoglobin protein, we would see that the human and the lamprey have a ton of differences in their, in their amino acid sequence. But a human and a dog only have 32. So we would say that a human and a dog are more closely related than a human and a lamprey. So comparison of macromolecules such as proteins and DNA, organisms with more similar sequences are considered more closely related. And then we also use the fossil record. So we look at how changes in organisms can be traced through the fossil record. And we know that fossils found in closer layers are typically going to be considered a more closely related species because the layers um, can give us an idea of their age, right? Older organisms are going to be found in the deeper layers of the fossil record. More recent organisms are going to be found closer to the surface. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about cladistics. So cladistics shows evolutionary relationships based on shared derived characteristics. And we illustrate these relationships through a diagram right here called a cladogram. Phylogeny is the science of evolutionary history. So that's what we're showing in cladistics with a cladogram. We're showing what characteristics they share, what characteristics are unique to them, and then therefore how are they related in terms of evolution. So look at this, this um, cladogram right here. This would be the characteristic that is shared by everything above it. So everything except for our amphibians has an amniotic egg. Everything above hair has hair. So dinosaurs, birds, crocodiles, turtles, and amphibians do not have hair. These are called derived characteristics. So fill in your example here on your notes organizer. A vertebrae would be our ancestral characteristic because it's the, the characteristic that our ancestor had that is shared by all of the organisms in our cladogram. These would all be considered derived characteristics. Bony skeleton, four limbs, amniotic egg, hair, so on and so forth. The vertebrae is our ancestral characteristic. And then last, we have dichotomous keys. Dichotomous keys are a tool that allows the user to determine the identity of an item or organism based on its characteristics. The word dichotomous means cut in two parts, di, to, cot, being cut. So 
So divide it into two parts. Um, and then a dichotomous key, you're always given two choices. So let's say you're outside and you come across a leaf and you want to know what kind of tree did this leaf come from. You could use a dichotomous key to identify the tree that that leaf came from. You would read a statement and you would follow the steps of that statement based on the leaf that you're trying to identify. So some things to keep in mind, you're going to make a dichotomous key. Characteristics should be characteristics that stay the same. So don't necessarily say like this leaf has a tear on it because that leaf is not always going to have a tear on it. That particular leaf might have a tear on it, but not all of that kind of leaf is going to have a tear on it. Do you get what I'm saying? Instead of saying things like large or small, use specific measurements. Try to make the choice a positive one, meaning it is instead of is not. If you can, not always, that's okay. If possible, start both choices of a pair with the same word. Finish the dichotomous keys with the identity of that organism. And if done correctly, here's a trick. You should have one less step than the number of organisms you're trying to identify. So if you're trying to identify 10 organisms, you should have nine steps in your dichotomous key. So here we go, 10 organisms, two, four, six, eight, 10. We have nine steps, okay? Each one has a choice, so I'm trying to identify C. I would go through each one, follow wherever it tells me to go. It's sort of like a choose your own adventure. Remember those reading those books when you were a kid? And then eventually you should come across the name of that particular fish. You're trying to identify an unknown organism. So for the last thing I want you to do today is there's a very simple dichotomous key on your notes organizer. I want you to complete it. I promise you it's easier than it looks. So try and figure out the scientific names of our little um, emoji faces, creatures, whatever you want to call them. All right, have a great day.